Welcome to our first roundtable discussion on the topic addressing the issues and challenges in Philippine teachers' education. This RTD will explore the space of culture in basic education and teacher education, particularly on understanding the value of its integration in the basic education and teacher education curricula. We will benchmark on the best practices of TEIs in training their pre-service teachers as culture-based educators. The RTD will also identify the challenges encountered by TEIs and the future directions that must be taken in ensuring that future educators will not only be competent subject matter experts and pedagogues, but equally important, effective agents of the cultivation, propagation, and preservation of the rich and diverse Filipino culture. To help us elucidate the topics, we have invited esteemed administrators of teacher education institutions and also some of the brilliant minds behind the teacher education policies, standards, and guidelines crafted by the government and the dedicated hands in the forefront of teacher training in the country to serve as discussants in our RTD. Again, we have Dr. Jan Arnold Eschena, Director of the National Educators Academy of the Philippines under the Department of Education. Dr. Edison A. Fermin, Vice President for Academic Affairs of the National Teachers College and Co-Chairperson of the Technical Panel on Teacher Education of the Commission on Higher Education. And Dr. Rita May P. Tagalog, Dean of the School of Education of the University of San Carlos and Zonal Representative for Visayas of the Teacher Education Council. For my first question for our roundtable discussion, for a developing country such as the Philippines, which has the tendency to prioritize economic development in its long-term agenda, why does the teaching of culture matter? Can we have Dr. John first, perhaps? Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I would like to... Uh, First of all, thank the organizer of this uh, roundtable discussion for inviting me over to this uh, very worthy activity. Um, we know very well that uh, the K-12 curriculum has been very sensitive to cultural education as it is uh, provided in the law, uh, even in the IRR. And even the Secretary of Education has mentioned that uh, for education to be truly liberating, it has to have a very strong cultural um, component to it. And in fact, she has been very um, strong in her advocacy in making sure that um, culture is in fact integrated in the curriculum and even in the way it is taught in the Department of Education. And I think that it's coming from the view that uh, for the country to really develop, it has to first of all uh, go back to its roots. And go going back to the roots of um, the people will mean that you have to go back to the culture, the, the shared values and uh, practices and beliefs and um, even uh, artifacts that we are sharing, uh, they have to be at the forefront of our education as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Doc Ed? Um, I very much uh, like the observation that for developing nations, there seems to be a predilection towards prioritizing um, economic uh, uh, indicators of uh, development uh, more than its uh, cultural advancement. But uh, in the case of the Philippines, I think we've been trying our best to strike the balance between the two, but uh, poverty-related concerns have always uh, uh, given us the impetus to prioritize economics, really, and less of the cultural dimension that uh, we ought to be paying attention on uh, in the first place. But uh, why culture? Because I think uh, you could advance all you want in terms of your uh, economy, mm -hmm. but uh, eventually all of those will be short-term in terms of uh, gains. But if you invest in cultural education, your people's appreciation of their identity, their understanding that they are very much similar despite and in spite of geography related differences that will actually propel the nation towards a more lasting and sustainable appreciation of any developmental efforts mm -hmm. such that there will be sooner or later 
a very good confluence between economics and culture. And when that happens, that means to say, culture is seen both as uh, a capital for mm. economic development, but more importantly, for strengthening the very fiber of identity that characterizes every Filipino citizen. So that's the long and short of uh, how I see this uh, item. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ed. How about Dr. Rita? Do you have anything to add to those insights? Okay, for me, understanding one's culture is an important process to self-discovery. Knowing who we are, for example, our tradition and custom play a significant role in shaping our principles, morals, and what we believe in. And the self-discovery can be facilitated in the teaching and learning environments. But why facilitating this process matters in relation to the economic development of our country. According to Socioeconomic Planning Secretary Ernesto Empernia of NEDA, identifying Filipino culture is essential in creating well-targeted plans and effective policies that can bring about positive changes in our country. He emphasized that this provides insight on speci specific Filipino cultural values and have potential effect on national development and the role they play in shaping the public policy. For example, the innate creativity of Filipinos, which can be seen in our music, performance arts, theater, and others, is an, is an opportunity to encourage, support, and promote the creative industry in the Philippines, which based on the study of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies in 2014, has contributed as much as 5.4% of the country's gross domestic product in 2009. Therefore, a strong linkage between academia and the industry, as well as early understanding of one's culture and self-discovery is important to help Filipinos achieve the medium-term plans as well as long-term vision such as Ang Ambition Nothing 2040. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since the implementation of the competency-based curriculum in basic education in 2013, which was re-emphasized by its reduction into the most essential learning competencies this pandemic, cultural agencies such as the PISEP, cultural educators, and cultural workers have become increasingly conscious of the need to infuse specific cultural learning competencies in the basic education curriculum. What do you think are the essential culture-based learning competencies that must be taught to our K-12 learners? Of course, we understand uh, the curriculum must be culturally sensitive, that is specifically prescribed in RA 10533, and also as mentioned by Director Shena, it's also in spirit part of the IRR. But if we are to identify particular culture-based skills, what could be these skills? And can you elaborate a little on the necessity of these skills? Would like to begin? Alvin? Uh, yes. Yeah, because you because you've mentioned uh, K to twelve, and which is very much within the purview of the basic education. Maybe I would like to comment first. Um, while the general framework of K-12 actually recognizes the importance of uh, culture, uh, because we said that the, one of the characteristics of, of K-12 curriculum is that it is gender and uh, culture sensitive. But specifically, uh, there are competencies that are basically uh, integrated in the different um, in the different learning areas, as well as even embedded in the different competencies across, I would like to believe across learning areas. But um, I'd like to emphasize also that for cultural education to be, um, to be given emphasis um, in, in any learning area, there should be an element also of um, deep appreciation of one's culture, first of all. In other words, the teacher, regardless of the learning area and grade level, should be able to uh, surface those um, elements of one's uh, cultural heritage because by, by being able to put that up front and uh, being able to uh, make the children conscious of what this um, cultural heritage and, and cultural elements in the curriculum and the competencies that they need to, to develop, then 
basic then you eventually develop also their pride in their one in their own culture so i think that part of that appreciation as well as their pride in their in their heritage at the same time um being able to recognize diversity as well uh, not just in in the school but as well as especially in the community how they actually live their culture and how they recognize differences in in culture or or even in in beliefs um uh, or a way of doing things as well as sensitivity to these differences as well and, and therefore respect for that um for that culture for the differences and for the diversity of culture as well should should come out and should be very important especially now that we are in a, a high um in a society that is characterized by high plurality in terms of mm -hmm. culture um and and those things thank you thank you sir before i ask our two other discussions may i know if nayap has some of uh let's say seminars workshops or trainings that also uh help teachers to become more culturally and uh, gender sensitive to their learners and the community in general um at the moment uh the, the way we look at our design is that part of our standards in mm -hmm. developing the trained designs for teachers is actually looking at the the gender um aspect of the training um mm -hmm. at the same time being able to also infuse some cultural some cultural elements in the standard mm -hmm. um it, it, it at the moment it's not a uh uh what you call this a an isolated or rather a focused cultural education but mm -hmm. what we are doing now is actually to infuse um elements of culture and gender sensitivity in the standards in the way we design and even evaluate our training program and and having you mentioned that and and um i think that moving forward from a uh, we need to be more uh, proactive in this area by making sure that we also have a specific training program for uh, cultural sensitivity as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Rita. Yes, um, the, policy of, the policy guidelines of RA 10.533, or otherwise known as the Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013, describe the K-12 graduate as a holistically developed Filipino who has built the foundation for learning throughout life and equipped with the 21st century skills, such as information, media and technology skills, learning and innovation skills, life and career skills, and communication skills necessary to tackle the challenges and opportunities in the 21st century. Now, these expected outcomes or learning competencies in the K-12 graduates can be developed in a culturally-based education or in a culturally based teaching learning processes. For example, um, the development of uh, the development of information media and technology are embedded in the, the subject Araling Panglipunan, in MAPE, and in other subjects. So I believe what is needed then is the adherence to these culturally based curriculum principles such as the mother tongue based education for early grades, uh, the, the culture sensitiveness of the curriculum, and the cont contextualization to personal and sociocultural setting uh, of the curriculum so that this can really promote culture based learning or culture based learning competencies in the basic education. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Sir Ed? Yeah, in the, my appreciation of how we connect the teacher education program at the Commission on Higher Education and the provisions of the K-12 program, I would love uh, to articulate three important points where uh, both DepEd and CHED agree on what we need to use as fundamentals of uh, cultural education. From kindergarten to 12th grade, believe it or not, the patterns or the themes are one and the same. And within the structure of our uh, course uh, outlines, our syllabi, our learning exemplars, you will find that the first step is actually to teach our students to know their culture and their country. Kilalanin ang iyong kultura at ang iyong bansa. Dahil ikaw ay integral na bahagi nito, at ang pagkilala ng iyong kultura 
ay pagkilala rin ng iyong bansa. So that's the first major the- thematic uh, umbrella upon which competencies in cultural education are lodged. And we assume that by knowing fully well what we have and appreciating them thereafter comes in the next dimension, which is to love our culture and our country. Mahalin ang kung ano ang mayroon ng ating kultura at ang ating bansa. Dahil naniniwala ang K-12 na kapag minahal mo ang iyong sariling kultura at ang iyong bayan, ay higit nating mapapaiting ang ating pagkakakilanlan habang patuloy na uh, lumalaganap ang konteksto ng globalisasyon kung saan nagkakaroon na ng kalabuan kung sino at ano ang pagiging isang Pilipino. Uh, and when we are capable of understanding both the underpinnings and loving or manifesting our love for what we have, then we should be compelled to do the third dimension, which is to help grow our culture and country. Now, in addition to the points raised by my colleagues earlier, I think the direction of training our teachers and all others in, others engaged in the education sector would be a three-step process. All trainings have to begin with allowing people to comprehend fundamentals and issues of cultural education as they exist or persist in the Philippine context, along with the voices of several other nations impacting on that idea of a pluralistic definition of culture, as what Dr. Tagalog mentioned. And with students and teachers both comprehending the same language, they are move towards creating creating possibilities about our cultural um, uh, our material culture and what we can do so much about them as we continue to uh, find ourselves in the discourse of the global uh, cultures out there and finally of course this is the favorite of all teachers once you are able to create something you ask to, to you ask the students to say something about what they created which is actually correct once you have created something you must explain it you must stand for it and i think by constantly teaching communication skills along with cultural education skills we are creating a new uh, generation of students and teachers capable of really explaining up to the last detail why the tinala is believed to be a representation of the dreams of the Tibolis and why the way we prepare different rice-based um, meals matter. And believe it or not, uh, Sir Alvin, when we actually subject teachers and students to comprehending, creating, and communicating along these lines, you will see that culture was the first ingredient of the K-12 curriculum because that's where the child is actually well immersed in. And we believe that K-12 being the learner-centered curriculum is also a culturally sensitive curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ed. So masarap ang talakaya natin, no? We are coming to a realization that actually cultural education is not something that is confined to particular learning areas like in the case of social studies, Filipino, or music arts and PE and, and health, but actually it's a shared responsibility among all our teachers. Which leads me now to my question, how can we effectively and seamlessly integrate this in subject areas not commonly associated with culture, such as, let's say, science and mathematics? Do you have suggestions? Okay, so I think Ed, it's my turn to... Uh, yeah, okay, so... Uh, I'm coming from my background as a language teacher where, mm-hmm. where culture is necessarily a vital component um, to begin with. But over the last uh, two decades that I have engaged in classroom teaching and the t- training of teachers, believe it or not, the key to understanding where culture comes in is with the teacher asking the question, where in the daily lives of students will a particular concept be most likely coming alive or very much related to. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I worked with a team of mathematics teachers uh, some years ago when 
DepEd created the Content-Based Learning Institute where we were trying to beef up the, com the communication skills of students while at the same time enhancing their content knowledge in the various areas. So I was working with a group of math teachers and uh, I posed a challenge to them, which was, uh, where would our students bring the knowledge of uh, combinations and permutations? Hmm? That's in combinatorics in mathematics. Where will they use <laughs> those skills and concepts? No? So the only thing that uh, people know is that uh, combinatorics in the matter of combination and permutations will ask you to sequence things, and that's about it. But we ended up uh, by telling each other, you know, combinatorics is very much germane to the Filipino spirit of ingenuity. You know why? This is the country where usong uso sa atin ang combo meals, right? Uh, where it, whether it's tapsilog or combo one, combo two, combo three, you will find elements that are repeating, but they are arranged differently. You know what? When we finished creating the lesson exemplar for that, they were saying, so it's not just about teaching mathematics in Filipino, but teaching mathematics the Filipino way, in the way our students can respond to them. Because by definition, Culture is our daily existence. So if a content teacher is able to find out that, ay, madaling ituro ang math, gagamit lang ako ng combo meals, maiintindihan niya ng mga bata. And you know what? When we tested students, based on their appreciation of our cultural model and the typical explanation of the math teacher, the ones who actually learned the concepts via the combo meals got higher scores. <laughs> because... They are thinking as Filipinos and using advanced concepts in other disciplines within their cultural realities, which validates my assumption that we share with other people that the more culturally sensitive the core, the content, and the technique, the more education can become made relevant and engaging. Thank you. Beautiful, sir. Dr. Rita. Yes, uh, in addition to Dr. Fermin's sharing, um, as I mentioned, adherence to culturally based curriculum principles and utilization of culture based pedagogy paved the way on the effective integration of and the development of the culture based learning. I just would like to share this example uh, in integrating culture based learning competency or utilizing culture based pedagogy. In the study conducted by the Batanga State University with the use of Carrerang Bangka, an aspect of Batangueño culture, in teaching linear motion and other aspects which were used in teaching physics, this is an innovative way of teaching method which will help students gain academic knowledge along with the insights to cultural aspect of the country, just like what Ed, Sir Ed really uh, shared a while ago. Yeah. and emphasized. Another example is the use of the ethnomathematics framework in developing culturally relevant mathematics education for indigenous students. A study conducted by Willie Alangi in UP Baguio who developed mm -hmm. guided lessons that come from Pamanaka, the Mangyan's knowledge about cassava harvesting and fishing to develop mathematical lessons. Pamanaka teachers and administration found the theory of ethnomathematics to be relevant and supportive of their efforts of the mathematics education in their school. Now, these culture-based teaching approaches may help curriculum planner and implementers in creating a pedagogy that enhance students' motivation and academic performance. In this way, the Filipino culture and tradition will be preserved and through culture-based pedagogy methods, learning competencies will be meaningfully achieved by the students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rita. Dr. John? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question, Sir Alvin. Um, in fact, I'm remind, I was reminded of the research that was conducted by a friend uh, regarding the use of mother tongue in teaching mathematics. I was actually, because she, she shared with me the, the, when she developed this research, she was actually expressing her 
her own because she's really a mathematics teacher through and through and she's been teaching mathematics in English for uh, since from the very beginning and and she was actually sharing her own apprehension with me regarding how mathematics would be taught in, in Filipino, in, in mother tongue. Um, but she was surprised that in that research that she conducted, the students who were taught in mother tongue actually performed better in, 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 in her um, assessment. And it got me to thinking, uh, I just remembered that um, uh, mathematics is not, is, is not strictly a Western concept. In other words, you can actually uh, bring to life mathematics within the context of a particular culture and language by itself is, is culture. How much more if we are able to bring into the picture, into the pedagogical context, the, the cultural elements within the mathematics lesson. So that even makes that more powerful, right? So I, I'd like to believe that um, by being able to bring in a culture, even in uh, subjects or learning areas that are on the surface quite difficult uh, to integrate culture. Uh, in fact, there are actually uh, very natural sort of um, openings for culture to, to actually uh, be integrated in subjects like mathematics and, and science, just like what my friend actually found out. Um, in, in science, we, we know that the concept of uh, culture sensitivity in the curriculum is not just about subjects like Makabayan or Araling Pandipunan or even values education. But in fact, um, it can be the, the, the idea of cultural education in the curriculum is actually um, encompassing all the, the learning areas, if you ask me. It should, in fact, encompass the different learning areas. And that is where the localization, indigenization, um, contextualization will come in because that whole process of localization will always go will always allow the teacher and, and in fact the students to always go back to their community and find out what are the, the, the things that they find in their own context that they can bring to the classroom and learn about it and even make it part of, their, of the learning process. So, um, so I believe that uh, you know, there are many ways by which uh, cultural elements can actually be integrated, not, not just in Makabayan or Aralik Panipunan or other subjects that are uh, typically um, uh, cultural in, in orientation, but in fact, even in science. For example, when you study flora and fauna or even habitat, this concept of ecosystem, you can actually bring in um, the, the local context for, for this concept. Even in mathematics, um, while it is possible now that you can actually use your mother tongue or even in, in it is in, in fact encouraged to use your your mother tongue when things are getting more complicated in terms of you know um, uh, comprehending the concept. But there, um, but using and referring to certain local structures for problem solving, for example, local activities as pointed out by uh, Dr. Fermin and uh, and uh, Dr. Tagalog. These are re really very rich. The community actually the, is is a very rich uh, resource for integrating culture even in mathematics and science. It's just a matter of you know uh, being able to. Uh, sensitize ourselves in what is really happening in the community and bring this uh, into the classroom, uh, even in science and mathematics classroom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is a common practice that we benchmark from the innovations from abroad, let's say, like in math, if there's Singapore math, there's common, we try to adapt that and implement in our setting. But I think instead of being uh, adapters of um, culture or someone importing it from the outside, I think we should also challenge our teachers to produce their own knowledge by looking for this integration or intersection of culture and their respective subject areas. This now brings me to my fourth question, which is, how does the teacher education curriculum from CHED prepare our pre-service teachers in becoming effective agents of culture? And why do you think the cultivation, preservation, and or propagation of culture should begin in teacher education? Let me ask Dr. Ed first from the yes. teacher education panel of CHED. Okay, so I think the question naturally falls within the purview of the work of uh, the technical panel for teacher education. But I have to clarify, Sir Alvin, that what inspired us to frame the 10 new program standards guidelines in teacher education since 2017 
are actually the stories coming from the likes of uh, Director Shena and Dr. Tagalog. What teachers are more keen about uh, understanding in terms of the confluence of culture and the realities of the classroom? So you will find that, uh, of course, all our degree programs, um, undergraduate degree programs, respond to what we call as Philippine Qualifications Framework Level 6. And in PQF Level 6, we have articulated certain indicators that our students should actually be able to show by the end of four years in the undergraduate program. And when you look at the PSGs, you will find there a specific emphasis on preserving, cultivating, and developing our cultural heritage across uh, the degree programs in teacher education. But I'd like to pay specific attention on how we ensure that cultural education competencies, its fundamental, their fundamentals and their applications are woven within the curriculum. Of course, there's GE, and GE has for itself the contextualization of many introductory disciplines within the Philippine context. But in teacher education, you will find this enshrined in the professional education subjects first and foremost. In fact, you know, um, there are uh, two new courses that are actually very influential, no, not just two, three, very influential in the in integration of cultural education in the consciousness of our pre-service teacher education students. There is what we call the school uh, the community and the curriculum. I think I, I forgot the exact uh, titling. <laughs> uh, pardon me for that, but there's one that talks about the confluence of the school, the community, and the curriculum. And that actually preface, prefaces the entire instructional process or educative process on the needs of the community. And then you have there the introductory course on inclusion which means that we have to embrace diversity in our country. And that's where we place it. Uh, that's where we place those uh, cultural education specific uh, competencies. More than an appreciation of the variety of learners, their conditions, whether they are difficulties, disabilities, and the like, it's really also more of where are our cultural variations stemming from and why they should strengthen us more than divide us. And last but not the least, of course, we have introduced a new course on building literacy across the curriculum. But the term literacy here also uh, embraces the idea of cultural literacy as an important dimension. Then elsewhere, whether you are taking major courses, especially the methodology courses and the research courses, you will find an explicit impetus on using local um, culturally sensitive resources and the experiences of our people as part of the pedagogical repertoire of teachers. In fact, even to the point of encouraging, can you find a community-based practice which can actually be translated into a teaching practice? For example, in research, we always say that it has always been a logical positivist orientation. But when we look at the more culturally sensitive uh, dimensions of uh, Filipinologia, you will find out that chismisan, uh, umpukan, will be very good research practices to teach our students. So I could go on and on, but this is how essentially they are structured within our teacher education programs at the undergraduate level. Thank you. In fact, I think the curriculum now is more innovative because there are particular courses that we can take advantage of in infusing culture in the preparation of our uh, pre-service teachers. Like in our case in UST, we are choosing the indigenous creative crafts. This is one of the elective courses under the humanities and social sciences cluster where we not only expose the students to the different arts and crafts of the country, but empower them to use this as instructional materials. So they uh, use the, they, they take advantage of the course in preparing different IMs that can later be taught or used in their uh, practicum. Dr. Rita? Yes, um, Saringo, thank you. 
I, am, I really appreciate the comprehensive discussion of Dr. Ed Fermin in the evolution of the curriculum for culture, culture and arts education. No? Um, it's, it's a good feeling from coming, up, coming from the TEI who is offering and implementing the curriculum to know the details of, of or the history of such creation or development of the curriculum. Now, from the perspective of the TEI, uh, the rationale itself and the background in developing the curriculum, which are, un uh, which are anchored in the following standards, such as, for example, the outcomes-based education that provides a clear picture of what is important for Filipino students to be able to do, the enhanced basic education curriculum, the Philippine, the Philippine qualifications framework, and the Philippine professional standards for teachers, these standards and policies and guidelines um, have created or have paved the way the innovative and uh, more flexible curriculum for culture, arts, and education. And DEIs, although we are required to deliver the curriculum based on those guidelines, but it's also important. It is also important, and uh, uh, we are also uh, grateful to know that the curriculum is really designed specifically coming from the professional education courses to major education courses. Um, the development of highly motivated, creative, and reflexive teachers equipped with knowledge, skills, and values in culture and arts education. And since TEIs or the teacher education programs are responsible in developing future teachers, the formation and training of these teachers must include the promotion of cultivating, propagating, and preserving one's culture, as well as understanding of other cultures so that they too and their students can be agents of a culture that can transform a society. Thank you. Thank you, Director John. Anything else on why do you think the cultivation, preservation, and or propagation of culture should begin in teacher training? Uh, well, even in the pre-service, uh, Alvin, Sir Alvin, I think that the very foundation of our cultural education in basic education should actually be started even um, in the pre-service. And even uh, in the choice of, uh, uh, of our teachers uh, in terms of entry to the education uh, career should also consider that kind of sensitivity of our future teachers uh, going into the teaching career, uh, which is very important because it's you know, it would be very difficult already for the Department of Education to intensify its even its efforts in training our teachers for cultural education when they when the uh, the preparation is not is not very solid. So I believe that uh, the pre-service education will play a very critical role in, uh, in, in in equipping our teachers for cultural education. Just wear a different hat, your hat as top administrators of your specific institutions. May I ask, how do your institutions support the integration of culture in teacher education? Please share some of your best practices. Start with Dr. Rita. Dr. Rita? Uh, okay. The question again The University is, of San Carlos. Call, yes. Sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, my, my connectivity. Okay. The University of San Carlos School of Education has implemented a research-based support and integration of culture and arts education through the following activities. So we have two activities currently um, implemented. First, the ongoing research by a team of teacher education faculty entitled Community Book Writing in Mother Tongue, Strengthening Local Languages and Culture in, is being conducted with the following objectives to provide mother tongue-based reading materials 
for children in the communities, particularly in the Talaandig uh, tribe, set up community managed libraries of local and indigenous stories in the mother tongue. And the second one is an ongoing production of unpublished local and indigenous folk tales by the graduate students in the course socio-educational issues using the Bloom software to support public school teachers reading materials in the new normal. This project is an outcomes-based response on the course to domain one, four, and six of the PPST. Uh, the produced books uh, in this course in the mother tongue based will be printed and distributed to a chosen elementary public school in Bohol. So this is how our university is supporting the integration of culture in teacher education. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sir Ed, what are your best practices in, the, in NTC? Um, just to let you know that uh, recently, the National Teachers College transitioned to a new leadership um, under the Ayala and Yuchenko groups. And you know that these two groups are not only um, groups that are dedicated towards uh, expanding business opportunities, but these are groups which have a long lasting tradition of supporting Philippine culture and the arts. And it's important that in the way we plan out how culture and the arts should be given life in our programs, we need to make sure first that we are equipped with the right people who can manage the program. So I just want to let you know that it was very crucial for us to decide that one of our education program supervisors in the undergraduate level should be a PhD degree holder in cultural education. And boy, it was difficult to look for one, but it was all worth it because having one specialist in cultural education really intensified our attempt to say that every discipline is a cultural education discipline. We may not have sophisticated research infrastructures like what you will find in a research university such as the University of San Carlos, but what we have to, what we have been investing in would be strategies in engaging students in adapting, localizing, and more importantly, looking for the indigenous variation of teaching, experience, teaching and learning experiences. It is important for us to actually ensure, at least for the teacher education students, to go towards the direction of exploring our local culture context as basis for instructional planning and decision making. But uh, for the other degree programs, more than the use of uh, co-curricular and extracurricular activities focus on learning culture, we make it a point also that there are opportunities, but more than opportunities, options for students to actually uh, uh, connect whatever project that they might be required to produce by the end of a semester. If, if they so decide to anchor that project on upon a certain uh, cultural underpinning, we give them that freedom because we believe that by encouraging such behavior of uh, inquisitiveness about our culture, even the IT majors can eventually create an app that helps our other generation of students become more appreciative of Philippine culture. And in fact, uh, it's crazy, but it's true. Some of our students are creating apps that actually are patterned after cultural tendencies of Filipinos. And I find it amazing because you're using artificial intelligence to actually uh, be connected to the way our cultural behaviors may be predicted or may be understood better. So in other words, uh, it's not a hyphenation of some sort, like uh, IT slash cultural education, hyphen cultural education. It's really IT or let's say psychology within the context of cultural education. So much so that NTC's core value of nationalism is the major and overarching principle at work. If you want to produce nationalistic psychologists or nationalistic teachers, we have to make sure that cultural education is not only a theory, but something that students can freely practice and explore. So that's what we have been doing over the last nine decades. 
<laughs> and more importantly today. Thank you, Sir Ed. Director John gave us a glimpse of some of their practices earlier, but do you have something else to add, sir? Uh, yeah. Um, well, actually, to be honest, we have just started working on this cultural education aspect of our training program uh, along with gender because this is one of the themes that came out actually as one of the priorities of the, of the secretary. Um, however, I'd like to mention that, of course, with in-depth ed, uh, well, actually, I, I just remember also that we have a partnership program with uh, National Culture uh, NCCA uh, on the cultural mapping, uh, which we, uh, we hope to be able to implement in different areas in the Visayas, so that we'll be able to gather all these uh, cultural um, artifacts and structures and landmarks and, and even people that maybe we can actually uh, put in our in our list of um, of cultural mapping documents, so that they can be made as a, as official reference of our teachers in their contextualization localization process. Uh, but at the same time, I'd like to mention that central office as well is very strong in terms of advocating for um, IT education, which is uh, practically our attempt to make sure our indigenous peoples are taken care of educationally, uh, services are uh, provided to them, uh, but at the same time being able to also make sure that their culture, their unique culture is also preserved and um, being passed on to the next generation uh, within their IT community. So, uh, and, and um, of course there are other um, efforts within the Department of Education, but in so far as the National Educators Academy of the Philippines is concerned, um, we have, as I said, we have just started making sure that all these uh, standards that we are following in evaluating training programs will incorporate as well um, cultural elements um, as part of uh, the experience that teachers should undergo in any training program. Uh, pardon you. me, Director Shena and uh, Sir Alvin, but there is something that I I'm very uh, eager to tell you, uh, something ahead, I experienced sir. myself uh, under NEA. You see, I've been invited as a summer trainer of some of the NEA programs before, or even the Bureau of Curriculum. Um, the very first thing that I appreciate about the recent trainings at DepEd, especially those run by the bureaus and NEA, is the fact that your trainers are no longer Manila-centric. <laughs> They're no longer coming from Imperial Manila. In fact, you know, I very much appreciate every time I hear my colleagues, the likes of Dr. Tagalog, talk about mother tongue-based multilingual education in Cebu. And if I could actually see evidence of how these uh, of how these specialists in the field are doing it, you know, the more I understand, this is uh, an archipelago of specialists, and I think that's very powerful. The more actually, and I think that's the inherent design of the trainer's pool of NAYAP and DepEd in general, to make sure that the voices of the regions are heard. That's why when we now come together as trainers, you know, it's funny and at the same time, very empowering. When I, when I listen to, let's say, someone from Agusan del Norte telling me that, uh, you know, the better way to, to teach a uh, uh, let's say, uh, lithification or nitrification of bodies of water, I can tell you the story of our bodies of water. But as she was telling that, she's already talking about the worldview, the mythology behind that body of water. And then when I go and listen to the, uh, the people from the North, their pamahiins, their other cultural tendencies manifest in the way they teach and the way they construct learning experiences. And I think that has succeeded in encouraging because the more we listen to the peripheries of, cultural, of our cultural context, I think the more we're able to strengthen our core because that is an important element in terms of distilling the concept of culture altogether. I just want to say that, sorry. <laughs> Because DepEd, DepEd has done a good job in that area. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ed, for affirming what we have been doing. In fact, that has been the direction of NEAP, to really go down to the grassroots and being able to also 
uh, develop our pool of trainers uh, in 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 their area, so that you know you don't have to you don't have to export Manila trainers to the <laughs> to the regions because we know that we know actually that there are a lot of of experts of uh, you know trainers who are as just as competent, if not more competent than the ones in in Imperial Manila. So that's actually what we have been doing for the past two years. And, and thank you for for bringing that up because I. Yeah. Uh, I almost forgot about it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's a beautiful sharing. Of course, we are a tapestry of different expertise, cultures, and local knowledges. And of course, if we could tap these different resources that we have throughout the country, then all the more that our culture could be, our multiculturalism could be appreciated, and all the more that these trainings could be more inclusive. So kudos to Nea for that. Actually, that uh, partly answers the next question about the challenges which we might encounter or are encountering at present in terms of effectively integrating culture in our teacher training. So what do you think are the challenges that we might encounter or might deter us in the future in effectively integrating culture in our teacher training? May we have Director John first? Yeah, sir, Alvin, uh, we have been very... Um... Uh, conscious of our assessments, especially the large-scale assessments. And um, of late, we have been preparing for PISA, and in fact, we're also preparing for uh, teams or the trends in international mathematics uh, and science study. Or, uh, uh, and, and, this, and this sort of, uh, pardon my word, obsession for assessment, sometimes we are actually bringing down this um, culture, culture of you know um, preparing for the for these large scale assessments and sometimes uh, our our efforts are are really concentrated on how do we prepare for these assessments even in the national achievement test um, our, you know, we know that our curriculum is also very loaded and sometimes what the teachers are actually doing are are simply to cover the content that they that they're expected to 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 teach to the learners for the you know limited um uh, 10 month period with, with so many disruptions and times um instead of the teachers going into a uh, deep dive into the cultural uh, aspect even in the content uh, using uh, your your relegated to the background because we are we are actually measured for something else and I think that is a uh, threat in being a culture uh, preoccupied with uh, assessments like this. Because um, we, uh, we need to understand that uh, many of these assessments that we are participating in are also international. And therefore, it's also difficult to, you know, to expect that they will, they will infuse some cultural elements um, in, in, in those exams. And, and by the nature of the exams itself, you, you cannot expect that people will you know, will be able to integrate um, uh, culture or cultural education and competencies in, in, those, um, in, in, in their preparation for, for those exams. So I think that is uh, uh, quite a, something that, you know, that is also bothering me um, for, uh, for us. When I saw the question and, and I was thinking about it, you know, th this, uh, th these assessments are, are really uh, uh, preventing us and maybe a threat okay, to effective integration of um, cultural competencies in our teaching learning process. That's a good point and you are so, raising, Doc Jan. I can just imagine what would be the type of standardized questions that PISA are asking, which of course might not be that encouraging to our students because they are outside of the context being provided by the particular items in the, in, in the test. Where when in fact in the actual teaching and learning, if it's of course contextualized, they are it's more inclusive for them. So I think who knows that could also be a part of a study or a research in the future, as how ostracizing let's say these standardized tests are for particular learners. Well, actually, I I, I just I well I'd like to believe that as, even if we prepare our learners for you know international benchmarks, we also uh, we, we are also mindful that the best for the best way for them to 
you know, to demonstrate the mastery of these competencies that are assessed will be, you know, infusing to the cultural elements mm -hmm. to make the lessons more, uh, you know, more uh, relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And I can only, you know, I, and I would like to believe that uh, even the way we, uh, the way we prepare our teachers for this assessment will also consider that at the same time. And um, uh, hopefully when, when we train, when we design our training for teachers to prepare them for this exam, uh, we can only infuse uh, this kind of consciousness in terms of making sure that we don't forget the cultural elements mm -hmm. in the way we teach, even as we want our learners to manifest higher order thinking skills or uh, skills in reading and so on and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rita? Yes, um, I believe that the absence and presence of culture and arts education program in a teacher education institute may influence the effective integration of culture in the teaching teacher training. Um, in my experience as member of CHED Regional Quality Assessment Team, we have identified some challenges that uh, a good number of DEIs are having in the plan to offer uh, the culture arts education as well as the integration of of culture in the teacher training. For example, the lack of appropriate qualifications and training of teachers who will handle the courses in the culture education and who will be advocating the culture-based education in the institution. Two, the need for multidisciplinarity in the delivery of the curriculum, which means that this should be taught in collaboration with different experts in the university or in the institution. Third, the lack of facilities and equipments that support instruction of culture-based education. And fourth, the lack of cultural linkages, such as the museums in the local government units and the community. So I believe these um, four challenges uh, cause or can deter uh, the, the effectivity, the effective integration of uh, teaching culture in the teacher training. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Fermin? Um, um, you know, while I was listening to Director John and Dr. Mm -hmm. Rita, I think what I'm gonna say um, might steer mm -hmm. another form of debate <laughs> in an already debate-driven context because you see, uh, so, I mean, this is how I see it, no? We are failing in our direction towards making cultural education work because we are operating in a policy environment that seeks to uh, that seeks to establish a monolithic and heavily standards driven orientation towards education. But culture doesn't operate that way. Culture celebrates diversity, plurality, spontaneity. In other words, anything but standards. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, what I'm trying to say here is maybe wearing my hat as a policy analyst or someone into um, uh, looking at the policy environment, I think cultural education, the way NCCA and the other groups uh, envision it to happen, uh, should be appreciated if we also have a bigger policy environment that does not only press upon teachers and learners definitive standards. That's why we call them minimum. So if they're minimum, they should not be the ones dictating what else ought to be done. Or we also have to train teachers, uh, administrators that you're not supposed to meet, to just meet the minimum. The direction is to do more. And to me, more means putting in what is unique in your context. Um, that's why I think uh, eventually, and I just uh, notes here, maybe the next time uh, Director John, Dr. Tagalog, and myself will co-author a paper that talks about are our professional standards <laughs> culturally sensitive <laughs> or are they enabling our teachers to actually exercise diversity and an appreciation of how rich our contexts are. Because if you just zero in on pounding on people's head, these are standards, these are standards, the tendency is for you to create 
a monolithic understanding not only of culture but education as a whole. And I don't think that's the direction the DepEd or the national government would like to take. So I think that's a major stumbling block. But I think what led us to that is the fact that policymaking is still not very transparent. It is a function of a few people. Much as we would like more people, more voices to be heard, what's happening is that there are only several groups or few groups lobbying to the point that to the point of forgetting that the sensibilities and sensitivities of other groups, whether they are cultural, political, or economic in nature, they need to be heard. Because that's how you create the concept of a nation. The nation is but the sum of the voices of all its individual parts. So it cannot be an imperial Manila set of standards, but it has to be a standards appreciated by everyone. And I think that's where I salute the kind of work that NCCA has been doing. You know, it's trying to bring in the voices of the regions really in trying to uh, reconfigure our appreciation of cultural education. Uh, and maybe uh, one of the homework, one of the assignments probably that this esteemed group should be doing is that we should be giving a cultural sensitivity workshop to our policymakers and the heads of the government agencies. In like manner that they are requiring gender and development workshops, let's require cultural sensitivity for all these people who talk about culture in a very shallow manner. You know, uh, I'll stop there because I think I will spark more debate. <laughs> <laughs> NCCA is taking note of all those observations because this will be part of their future plans and uh, directions. Actually, I will ask you, Sir Ed, to talk more because the last question now is about what should be the future direction of culture-based teacher education in the country and what are your recommendations to effectively achieve this? Of course, you have talked about it a lot, but if you have something else to add, please do so. Okay, I'll just zero in on, to me, is the most vital component right now. Um, you and I know that we are quite averse. When many, uh, when many lobbyists or lobby groups tell you that, oh, inject sexual education in the curriculum, inject uh, uh, environmental education, inject this and inject that, you know, they're missing a very important point. If you put them together, they equal cultural education. So I don't get it why people are saying, oh, let's put in a, a drug education, a financial literacy, and so on and so forth. You know, if we can only agree on a definition of cultural education competencies, you will find that all these makukulet na lobby groups fall under the umbrella of cultural education. And guess why they are insisting to be part of the curriculum? Because they feel they are marginalized. And that's the effect of, of cultural homogenization. They're not being brought to the discourse of culture, pluralism, and so on and so forth. That's why they insist. So to me, if we come together, including the policymakers and the lawmakers, to define what cultural education is as the sum of our individual voices, we will be able to put that in. And then from that, which I envision to be the cultural education directory of the Philippines. And by directory, I'm referring to specific measurable skills that can be mapped out into any program. The next thing that I want to see so that we could forward the discourse of cultural education is to teach teacher education institutions, uh, in-service training institutions, NAYAP, all these centers to actually find a way to seamlessly connect the contents of that directory into the daily habits, practices. Because, you know, to borrow the words of one of, um, um, of, one of the uh, former sources of um, knowledge about cultural education, remember, it's habitus. It's forming a habit. So culture is or has to be ingrained within us. It has to be lived out. But if we don't know exactly what to live out because we don't have a definitive guide, 
it's something like the condensed version of the CCP Encyclopedia of Philippine Culture and the Arts. Only that it's not coming out in several volumes, but probably a list. A list of things that probably make you and I proud to be Filipinos. So that's how I envision it. I know it's a, it's a, a something that we could do in the long run, but here's what I appreciate about what's happening right now. Research-based institutions such as the University of San Carlos are doing bits and pieces of this. They are articulating. NAYAP is also doing it. They are doing curriculum mapping. But can we not have the NCCA create an, a, the national agenda for integrating cultural education across levels of learning, whether it's in formal education, informal education, indigenous people's education, there has to be that roadmap. You know, interestingly, I'm part of a group that is creating the national roadmap for global competitiveness in communication. It's about English. And I will not be ashamed in telling you that. I was telling myself, we have a national roadmap for that, but we don't have a national roadmap for cultural education. And then I felt, maybe I should join that committee also. <laughs> so that's, that's the long and short of what I, what I want to see. I think PSEP is very much happy about the recommendations we heard from Dr. Ed, and I think they are... They will work on that in the in the succeeding year because I heard from Director Cristobal that actually this roundtable discussion is one of the preliminary bases of their data in terms of coming up with those standards, policies, guidelines in terms of culture education. Now let's ask Dr. Tagalog. Yes, um, I totally agree with the sharing of Dr. Ed Fermin that when education is rooted on local culture and the understanding of other culture, it gives an impetus for learners to have a better understanding and appreciation of the world they live in. So this should be emphasized and advocated by the Teacher Education Institute. But I would like to share two specific uh, recommendations on how to achieve this direction. One, uh, that the culture and arts education program um, in TEIs to offer the culture and arts education in TEIs and provide scholarship um, to the takers of the program, no? to CHED qualified uh, institutes. This is to raise the quality standards of knowledge and pedagogy of teachers assigned to teach the culture-based education in the basic education. Second is to train teachers on culturally based education and the perspective of education for sustainable development or ASD, a teaching learning perspective which is centered in the community's culture. So those are two recommendations that uh, I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, Director John. Yeah, um, it's, quite, it's quite disheartening uh, to think and, and to listen to this observation that apparently culture is being uh, discussed up as sort of an, as a separate uh, sort of entity, separate thing from the curriculum itself. When in fact, when you talk of a, when you talk of an education system, it has to already incorporate the the culture of of the country, right? But apparently, right now, it looks like when we talk of cultural education, it's like a subject matter by itself and not as something that's systematically integrated to, uh, into the curriculum, whether we're talking about a uh, pre-service education curriculum or whether we're talking about K-12. to Even if K-12 to is saying it's integrated, but uh, right now the, the practice, and from my observation, it appears that cultural education is, is a province of a particular learning area. And if at all it is being mentioned, it is mentioned in, in a very haphazard way, so I am looking forward to a, a, a you know to cultural education where it is seamlessly uh, integrated in in the curriculum in such a way that all teachers are actually conscious of it and that they're actually manifesting the skills of an of a uh, cultural uh, uh, um, to help us also. Uh, you know, create within NAYAP 
that kind of program that will bring to the consciousness of our teachers, regardless of whether they are in Mindanao or whether they are in Visayas or whether they are in Luzon or in Metro Manila. That consciousness that, you know, culture is, uh, cultural education is not just uh, in a particular learning area, but it is in fact something that you live every day, something that you're able to transmit, that you're able to communicate to your learners um, every day as you encounter them, whether you're online or whether you're on face-to-face -face basis. So um, I'm looking forward to that day when, when, that, when, that, when cultural education is, is totally part of the, you know, of the system and seamlessly integrated in the curriculum and in the learning systems, in the pedagogy, in the materials that we are producing uh, such that we, at the end of the day, will be able to say, uh, you know, we are a people uh, who, who are aware and who appreciate uh, their culture and who are led within their culture so that uh, that, pro that development that we're talking about will be more sustainable rather than a passing fancy. I guess that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shen. I think our collective efforts in the coming future will make those recommendations possible. And this concludes our roundtable discussion on addressing the issues and challenges in Philippine teacher education. We express our deepest gratitude to our esteemed discussants, Dr. Jan Arnold Eschena, Dr. Edison A. Fermin, and Dr. Rita May P. Tagalog. At this juncture, we shall now have our academic exchange. We will share some of the insights or raise some of the questions posed by our dear participants. Basic education. Thank you.